morning and welcome back to the lecture series on performative gender and religions in South Asia. Today we are going to start with a new topic which is the Sufi tradition. Uh, in the first lecture on this module, we are going to discuss about the provenance, the origin of uh, the Sufi tradition, how it emerged, how it uh, started uh, as a movement from within uh, Islam and then it broke away, it broke off from Islam, it became an offshoot of Islam and uh, the interfaces as well as the conflicts that the mainstream institutionalized uh, uh, Islam and Islamic faith uh, has, you know, with uh, the Sufi tradition. So, talking about the Sufi tradition in the 8th century uh, AD, Sufism emerged uh, in a prominent way in three major centers uh, in Iraq especially in the metropolitan cities of Basra, Kufa and Baghdad. Then uh, it also, uh, you know, uh, became prevalent in the politically turbulent uh, province of uh, Khurasan, especially in the city of Balkh. And finally, Sufism uh, became a widespread practice in Egypt. Other early centers apart from Iraq, uh, you know, uh, Khurasan and uh, Egypt uh, include Damascus uh, and the desert wastes of Arabia and Sinai. So, as we can see, the emergence of Sufi, just uh, like the emergence of Islam, is centered on the uh, western part of Asia, also called as the Middle East from the uh, European perspective. So, we will take a look at the different stages that uh, Sufism as a tradition has undergone, uh, its emergence, its uh, development into a cult and we are also going to explain the fundamental doctrines and practices uh, in Sufism. So, the concept of gnosis, gnosis or intuitive knowledge uh, known as marifa or hikmah. So, marifa or hikma uh, as a means of uh, comprehending or grasping the concept of God was first articulated by a Sufi saint called Dhul An Al Misri. So, the concept of marifa or hikma comprises intuitive or esoteric knowledge which leads to a comprehension of the God or the absolute and this could be uh, seen or studied in juxtaposition with the knowledge acquired through the uh, sensory experiences, the empirical experiences and through intervention of reason and rationality uh, which the mainstream Islam emphasizes. Uh, this uh, rational, uh, you know, understanding or sensory understanding in Islam is called as ilm, ilm or exoteric knowledge in Islam. So, marifa refers to uh, super intellectual knowledge of God, something that cannot be grasped by the five senses, something that is beyond that. So, as the concept of marifa or intuitive knowledge came very close to uh, the process of revelation. Uh, to Prophet Muhammad, the ulema or the major priests, the prominent priests uh, possessing the knowledge of Islamic law, also known as Sharia, became very critical and apprehensive of the Sufis who were claiming to have attained the process of uh, marifa, because uh, simply because they thought they, that they were contending with uh, the Prophet and they were trying to become, uh, you know, uh, other prophets, uh, alternative prophets of, uh, you know, uh, preaching their own religions as a departure from Islam. They, they perceived this process of marifa as essentially challenging uh, Prophet Muhammad's process of revelation and uh, a digression from Islam. So, during the 10th century AD, some important Sufis uh, in this regard, in this context, uh, as a result of a conflict between mainstream Islam and uh, the emergent Sufism, some Sufis had to sacrifice their lives uh, on charges related to the 
claim of intuitive knowledge. When they were claiming that uh, they possess or they have uh, attained intuitive knowledge, they were uh, sacrificed. Uh, conflict between the Sufis of different groups uh, or different orders and the ulema or priest that interprets uh, uh, Sharia has continued ever since in uh, different forms through different manifestations. So, the concept of fana is also uh, central to the Sufi tradition. What Sufis call as fana is the annihilation of the mortal self or absorption of the mortal self into the Godhead. And this was a central to the thinking of the Persian Sufi Abu Yazid al-Bistami. Now, what is fana? Let us try to understand. In the state of fana, through spiritual annihilation of oneself and immersion into the God, the dichotomy and distinction between I and thou uh, ceases to exist. Fana signifies the death of the self-will and self-consciousness and uh, we can see a parallel concept also found in Hinduism and Buddhism where the ephemeral self is completely uh, evanesced or drowned and the process is called as samadhi, someone that has been immersed so much into God that uh, the body is uh, as good as dead, the ephemeral self is uh, missing at least uh, for uh, a certain period of time, it is uh, not even there. It is present, but it is not functioning, that is that is to say, the ephemeral self is present, but not functioning. So, uh, another um, concept or another associated uh, doctrine is that of subsistence or permanence, uh, which is uh, called Baka. So, Baka uh, is love for God in the Sufi's life holds uh, a paramount uh, uh, you know place and uh, the hope that beyond personal annihilation there will be divine restoration or permanence is an idea that pervades uh, Sufi philosophy. So, according to al hujwiri Abu Said uh, Kharas was the first to explain the states of Fana and Baka, right? So, Kharas explained these two states uh, in Sufi practice for the first time. The doctrine of Baka signifies actual uh, permanence in the real. So, it represents a stage in human life, in a, a Sufi saint's life when a person loses his uh, status in the attributes of the real and achieves the vision of God. Fana is therefore defined as total nullification of an individual's ego consciousness and uh, in this stage there remains only the absolute unity and an absolute uh, awareness uh, prior to the bifurcation of this awareness between subject and object. One would not be wrong in saying that fana is a stage that precedes uh, you know one's uh, bifurcation uh, into subject and object. It is beyond uh, subjectivity and objectivity, right. Uh, fana to baka, the process of moving from fana to baka comprise uh, a tripartite division. So, A Sharia based on intellectual practices, B Tariqa, the Bailin path followed by Sufi saints and C Hakika, which is the ultimate truth or God. Now, something uh, parallel can be observed in uh, the, the Vedic interception or uh, you know understanding of uh, the all powerful God. So, uh, and even uh, you know uh, the Bhakti movement which is an offshoot of uh, Hinduism or Sanatan Dharma has different uh, paths of reaching uh, for reaching the 
God, the absolute. So, it talks about uh, the different yogas. So, the Vedantic philosophy has an analogy with uh, this tripartite division. There are different forms of uh, yoga to uh, attain the absolute or the God. One is the Gyan Yoga, which is uh, trying to uh, grasp the concept of divinity through uh, knowledge. Uh, through scriptures, which is very similar to uh, Sharia, right. Uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, in the Indic context, there is the Karma Yoga. Karma Yoga or uh, through mundane actions, through the right action, right karma, one can realize the God. And finally, uh, you know, the path of devotion, when a person has the least uh, social resources, neither access to knowledge nor access to, you know, karma uh, or, or uh, a person that has less, uh, you know, economic or social capital can still uh, be totally immersed in God through devotion or bhakti. So, jnana, uh, karma and bhakti, three yogas and uh, a person becomes a Paramhansa, the great swan uh, through, uh, you know, uh, a combination, through an assimilation of all three yogas in him or her, uh, which is, uh, you know, an assimilation of uh, uh, Jnana Yoga, Karma Yoga and Bhakti Yoga, which uh, results in uh, the Raj Yoga. Raj Yoga symbolized by the Kundalini, the snake. Right, well, uh, we have already discussed this in uh, our uh, modules on bhakti. So, coming back to Sharia, Sharia is very similar to Gyan Yoga, something you are trying to understand or intercept the concept of God through Gyan or intellect, your rationality, and then Tarika, the bilin path followed by Sufi saints, is somewhat uh, you know uh, analogous with the Hindu mystics, the bhakti mystics, the Vaishnava mystics, uh, you know that are a, a departure from the ritualistic uh, practices and uh, uh, the codified uh, scriptural descriptions of uh, God and div divinity. Uh, so, Tarika, the bilane path followed by Sufi saints is parallel to uh, the, uh, the offshoots uh, from uh, Sanatan Dharma, the, the Vedic uh, uh, scriptural uh, description or, or prescription for understanding gods, uh, they want to understand or grasp a god uh, first hand without uh, an intervention or mediation of a priest uh, or so they are a departure from the Brahminical tradition. Uh, and then we have Hakika, uh, the ultimate truth of God which is very similar to the Vedic concept of the Brahman. So, Brahman and uh, the, the Islamic concept of Allah that does not have any form are very similar. So, we see the Sharia, Tariqa, Hakika, these stages or, or these divisions are not external to but a ramification of Islam where there is a Salik or wanderer in search of his Suluk or goal. Uh, after reaching uh, the Suluk or the destination, the Salik goes through various hull or uh, states of being and through different maqams or stages possessing these different states and stations are called hakika. So, uh, according to the Sufi scholar Nisami, there can be three distinct stages in the development and growth of the Sufi movement in Islam. The designation of the first phase has been borrowed by Nizami from uh, Islamic scholar Reynald Allen Nicholson. According to Nicholson, the Sufis from the early era represented a reaction against the political conditions of the Umayyad empire. So, Sufism grew uh, necessarily as a breakaway from the Umayyad caliphate. There was a silent pro protest against the materialistic tendencies uh, observable among the rulers uh, by the profoundly God conscious persons uh, that started the Sufi movement. So, the early Sufis uh, 
visibly protested uh, or, or broke away from the caliphate and his materialistic trend tendencies. The prominent Sufis from this first phase or first period include Hassan al-Basri, Ibrahim ibn Adham, Abu Hashim Uthman and Rabia al-Adwaya al-Basri. So, the Sufis uh, from the first phase of the movement focused on their self-purification, uh, literature on Sufi thoughts began to appear uh, mainly during the 9th and 10th centuries AD and it is only uh, around 11th century that the Sufis began to organize themselves into groups. So, critic J. Spencer Trimingham's three-phase theory is pertinent to reflect on the historical evolution of Sufism. The first phase of uh, Sufism is known as the Khanka uh, stage. In the Khanka stage, uh, there is a marked, uh, you know, creative uh, boom, one may say, a boom or an expansion, a growth of creative thought and uh, the Sufi social organizations are marked uh, or defined by their simplicity. So, initially there were a number of, uh, you know, bonds observable between the master and his pupils, but later with uh, the Khanka or Sufi dwellings, these bonds were further more formalized in the Muslim dense uh, regions of the world. So, uh, initially we see that there are a number of bonds between the master and his pupils, but later they were, they became more organized in the form of uh, khankas or Sufi dwellings that proliferated in uh, all Muslim dense regions of the world. And then we have the second stage or tariqa. Tariqa that saw the doctrinal evolution and social organization of Sufism in the form of Sufi schools along with the formation of uh, spiritual lineages. Just like we have gurukuls and lineages, you know, organizations under certain gurus or, or gharanas. In the case of Sufi tradition, these gharanas, these lineages would be called as silsilas. The practice of a formal initiation was also introduced. So, the guru would initiate the pupil and in this stage, Sufism uh, gradually became institutionalized. It became a, an institutionalized and recognized practice. In the third and final stage, uh, which is known as Taifa, Sufism acquired the form of a cult Sufism. Sufism materialized into a cult with exaggerated veneration and even uh, excessive adoration of uh, Sufi practitioners taking place uh, and these practitioners came to be designated as the peers. The Sufi cults were centered on the spiritual power or blessing also known as baraka of a single individual, right. That individual had the position of the preceptor. The concept of headship was therefore introduced and the Sufi uh, lineages became kind of, you know, starting from one person, they became uh, hereditary, like just like the Gharana concept. Tombs of great Sufis came to be known as Dargahs and eventually the Dargahs were replacing the Khankas uh, to a large extent. This phase also witnesses the introduction of astrology and magic among the Sufi circles. Critic uh, Trimingham's theory uh, has certain inconsistencies in it and lately the recent scholarship uh, do not uh, really use uh, this theory uh, or, or these stages very strictly uh, uh, in, in uh, researching Sufism. They have been observed as redundant in uh, several ways. Fritz Meyer is another critic that periodizes Sufism into four historical phases, pre-classical uh, Sufism, classical Sufism, post-classical Sufism and neoclassical Sufism. According to Meyer, the 8th century AD 
constituted the pre-classical phase of Sufism when the woolen garment, the woolen garment was widely being worn by the Sufis. In fact, according to some critics, the word Sufi literally means woolen. We see that practices such as Sama, Sama referring to devotional musical concert and Dhikr, remembrance of God, repetition of the name of the God were developed during the uh, 9th and 10th centuries AD and the earlier part of the 11th centuries AD, 11th century AD. And uh, these practices uh, were uh, kind of uh, recognized and became more prevalent during the classical era of Sufism. Sufi ideas found a perceptible degree of public approval and Sufism emerged at one point as a religious movement, a religion in itself. So, a number of great Sufi masters uh, lived during the classical era and uh, during the classical era, you know, composition of Sufi texts and establishment of uh, purpose specific residential schools of the Sufis were also happening. Uh, in the post classical age of Sufism, which is corresponding to the end of the 11th and 12th uh, as well as the 13th centuries AD. So, it, it uh, the post classical period uh, lasted between 11th and 13th centuries AD, uh, a higher value was being placed upon visionary and occult uh, experiences, the esoteric experiences and practices. The post classical era, right, which comes after the classical era was also characterized by the veneration of the Sufi sheikhs, uh, the emergence of Sufi orders and the formalization and composition of a number of Sufi prayers and litanies. So, the neoclassical age of Sufism is uh, stretched between 13th and 14th centuries AD, neoclassical period that follows the post classical period and it was distinguished by a revival of the more restrained practices from the classical era of Sufism as well as a return to the fundamental principles of Islam. During this era, the reformers of Sufism that included uh, the Sufis as well as the theologians that are critical of Sufi practices uh, tried to uh, curtail or to tie down the excesses of Sufism and thereby marry or, or bring back Sufism within the folds of mainstream Islam. Islam which is uh, the, as a mainstream religion more restrained, more focusing on the mind than on the body. So, so there was a way of converging uh, this offshoot of Islam bringing it back to the into the folds of Islam. Unlike the earlier phases of Sufism, membership in a number of Sufi orders became prevalent during the neoclassical era. So, the phenomenon of Sufism is said to have existed even during the times of Prophet Muhammad uh, and this can be observed as many of his companions or sahabas uh, attained their own spiritual developments or, or visions, spiritual visions uh, by receiving spiritual guidance uh, directly under uh, the prophet. The Sufis from the 7th and 8th centuries AD either lived as isolated individuals or formed loose groups among themselves. Later from 9th century onwards, the Sufi groups came to be called as Taifa. Sufis from the earlier phase included the wandering mendicants. Uh, we are going to talk more about uh, Fakir, the process of becoming a Fakir uh, and, and, and these mendicants would travel from one place to another in groups or uh, alone as individuals and uh, sometimes they would even not lead a nomadic life, they would just be leading sedentary lives. With this, I conclude our lecture here today and let us meet in another lecture with another round of discussions. Thank you.